ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, that we can stretch it as far as um, comrades and friends. <laughs> Good. Um, thank you for coming. I think it should be obvious even to someone as modest as our guest of honor that a turnout like this is a serious tribute to a, a, a proper interest in history as a subject and historians and their craft. And it won't take me very long to introduce Eric Hobsbawm, who is, as well as being a distinguished local resident, um, a very distinguished historian. I can remember learning almost all I needed to know about the theory of historical materialism, reading your pre-capitalist economic formations <laughs> introduction to same in the Bodleian Library in, I think, 1967 as a young Trotskyist looking for heresies as well as, um, <laughs> and finding just a couple, as well as needing a better grounding than I then had in the historical materialist field. Um, and if we, as we now, I think, all, all semi-consciously or consciously do, uh, learn to periodize our history, not by the reigns of monarchs as we once did, but more by decades or it might be epochs or ages, to the extent that we do this and realize that it's the only way to think about history, we are, to that extent, very much in Eric's debt. Also, anyone who has wanted to study the origins of an interrelationship between industrial revolution and empire is in Eric Hobsbawm's debt, as is um, anyone who is interested in internationalism uh, as a politics or as a practice. And it's now come time for him to write his own history, long awaited. And I thought I'd begin by asking you how important it is to you to be Jewish. You can't get away from it. Uh, they won't let you. No, that's exactly it. They won't let you. Beyond that, um, I don't know. I, one of the problems I have, of course, <clears throat> is enormous difficulty about being Jewish in the era of Ariel Sharon. Uh, I'm a great believer in, you might say, uh, that the great, the Jews lived for I don't know how many thousands of years doing nothing very much except very subtle legal and theological debates and a good deal of very good uh, medicine. Uh, but basically, it's since the Jews were allowed to become part of the human race during the French Revolution that the potential of the very small people to which I belong has been realized. I regret trying to cut this out and reduce it to yet another small country, and not a particularly agreeable country either. Because in one way, I suppose, being Jewish is the apotheosis of being an internationalist, or being, a, as it has sometimes been said with an edge to it, um, a rootless cosmopolitan. I don't think I'm a rootless cosmopolitan, because I live in a modern world in which, in fact, it is impossible to divide to segregate, uh, to put people into separate corners. We live in a world in which, in a sense, particularly today, you live simultaneously in different cultures, in different countries, in different times. And the idea that somehow or other you can cut all this out and return to somewhere where you only live in, as it might be, Poets, or only in Connecticut, is absurd. Today, within a matter of days, let alone weeks, something that happens in the interior of China can affect what happens in Toronto, in London, anywhere else. Uh, I don't believe cosmopolitanism is, 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 is the way to describe this, the way the world is. Interdependence would has to be a better term. A complicated world, 
a difficult world, but a world which is interdependent and which, in which it is almost impossible to segregate yourself from it. And it's my, one of my great passions is to avoid uh, segregation or, if you like, provincialism. You know, when people say, for instance, uh, will there be an economic depression here? What they mean is, will there be an economic depression which affects Hay or which affects London? But in fact, since 1997, there have been massive economic depressions, worse than the 1930s, in large parts of the world. There are there now. Places like Argentina, Brazil have got through it. And I live in a world in which one has to be aware that our own local interests are not the only ones in the world. This is in the form of a supplementary or a corollary question, but it did seem to me scrutinizing your... your well, you don't quite like the word memoir, do you? Uh, so I, I'll just call it your, your autobiography. I thought memoirs are sort of things written by people who have contributed to history in a sort of positive way, like ex-generals and ex-politicians who think they want to record uh, what they've done for the whole thing. Well, I haven't done anything. I've written things and I've kept my eyes open. And I've tried to be as curious as I can about what happens. But I don't like calling it a memoir because... Uh, uh, it sounds like with rod and gun through the Punjab or something. It sounds much more like how I won World War II. Or, uh, <laughs> what? Yes. Um, but then here's my corollary question in any case. It seems to me, though, though you, you want to, one, we all would hope to rise above uh, what is local or localized about ourselves. But nonetheless, the fact that you have uh, Jewish ancestry and you spent a certain amount of critical time in your young manhood in Austria and in Germany must have been a very determining influence on your decision to become a communist. It's difficult to tell. I mean, it's perfectly clear that a disproportionate number of Jews became communists, largely because they felt that it's only in a world fit for all human beings that Jews, or for that matter blacks, would be allowed to be human beings in the full sense of the world. How far that affected me is very difficult to tell. I mean, my father and uncle, who lived in the 20s in Vienna, had at least one moment of uh, terrible, so to speak, conflict of loyalties when Bolton Wanderers came to Vienna to play Hakoa, which was the Jewish. <laughs> but that was about the only one they had, really, about this, you see. <laughs> well, as Englishmen and Jews in Vienna. Uh, otherwise, um, I didn't think about it an awful lot. But I suppose it's perfectly true that... Um, um, a universal, a system of universal liberation must suit Jews who suffered from not being universally or at all liberated for many, many uh, millennia. And you took part, did you not, in some of the last legal uh, demonstrations of, of Red Berlin before the, um, the advent of Nazism? Yes, but being Jewish had nothing to do with it. I mean, it was a young teenage <coughs> communist, yes. <coughs> Uh, the Jewish question was somewhat in the air, though, was it not? Sure, it was in the air, but I mean that wasn't uh, that wasn't anything that moved me. The, 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 my my main link with the Jewish question was, as I try and explain in my book, one one day when I was about ten, and I repeated something that somebody had said about one, one of my uncles, saying this was typically Jewish behaviour. She told me, you must, under no circumstances, ever do anything which might suggest that you're ashamed of being Jewish. And that's been the basis of my own thing. For that reason, when uh, there was a chance, as I was in Austria in those days, at the age of 13, 
to declare that you had no religion. I refused to do this because that might have suggested so. Uh, for that reason, I refused to change my name, even though my name is virtually impossible to spell and is being misspelled more systematically <laughs> in more parts of the world than any other. And for those reasons. But, you know, I've once tried to explain this in Israel. The only time I spent a great deal of time saying, uh, it, they, they wouldn't believe that it's enough simply as a basis of being Jewish to say, don't do anything that might ever suggest that you are ashamed or regarded as a, a, an undesirable thing to be Jewish. And that's it. But otherwise, I was a teenage revolutionary. You were a teenage revolutionary yourself, possibly, yes, yes. later, so you know what it is. Not under such exacting conditions, perhaps, but yes. No. And by the way, I, I, this might be the time to mention it, I was very intrigued, I almost actually fell off my chair, when you said that the experience of taking part in uh, these climactic demonstrations in Berlin was um, the, equivalent to the bliss of sexual intercourse, though you found it could be more prolonged. I wanted you to go on a bit more about it. <laughs> I didn't actually say it was the equivalent. Well, <laughs> it was the... I think that would be a mis... Well, perhaps I'm... An exaggeration. Perhaps I was too excited, but I'm... <laughs> what I said, it was an extremely intensive emotional experience, particularly at particular moments of history. And that's true. Uh, and a collective one. Um, The trouble about the period when Hitler came to power, what people don't understand is uh, the feeling that we lived really in an interim. There wasn't the world. The old world had gone to pieces at the end of the World War I. When my relatives, my continental relatives, talked about them and said, in peacetime we did this and that, they meant before 1914. Because anything after 1918, they didn't really regard as peacetime, as normality. It was a world in which, which had broken down and there wasn't another world. And what is more, between 1929 and 1933, what remained of the world was visibly breaking down. There didn't seem to be the slightest alternative to, I mean, either a revolutionary solution or the world simply going down the drain. Might have been, of course, an ultra right wing revolution, but then that's what the Germans thought. But then, for those of us who believed in, shall we say, that all human beings have got a right to exist in the world a specialist revolution which only deals with Americans or Germans or whoever is not satisfactory. Nevertheless, if you don't understand, people believe that there wasn't going to be a future unless something terrible was, or awful or hopeful was going to happen, revolutionary, dramatic. You can't understand what it felt like in those days, at least in Europe. You've, um, <clears throat> I've, I've read a lot of the reviews of your book as well as given your, your book itself two, two readings. And you've been criticized a lot for staying in the Communist Party until the very end of its life, in effect, until its dissolution. Um, though it's plain from your own account that you'd cease to be a believing communist in the 1930s sense quite a long time earlier. I would now say, having read, read it twice, that the, some of the accusations against you are, are ill-founded because you're trying to say how it felt, what it was like to try and retain a belief rather than justifying it. But have I, have I got that right? Are you, are you, as it were, recollecting what it was like to be a communist? Well, I'm naturally in favor of you know, being fair to the people who were in this movement. They were good people. They were people who were prepared to sacrifice themselves. They didn't expect anything out of it at all. I'm talking about the communists of the new outside the countries where communists were in the government. 
that's fine. Uh, I don't otherwise mind being, as it were, reviewed as an unrepentant red. Chiefly for a different reason. I think the most important thing today is to break with this tradition that we all lived in in the 20th century of living inside a long-term war of religion as people in the 17th century lived in a period of wars of religion between Catholics and Protestants. I think that was wrong. I was on one side, other people on other sides, but I think if anything's going to happen in the 21st century, which is an improvement in the last century, it is breaking with the idea uh, that there was a cause of good on the one side and a cause of evil and the two could not coexist. One had to overcome the other. It was an absolute permanent zero-sum uh, game. And I think communism in the 20th century has to be seen as a historic phenomenon, not as something where people like, somebody's recently been a late review of one of my books that says, well, it's a good book, it's quite interesting, it's not badly written, all the rest of it, and still, this guy is disgusting because, you know, he will not abjure what is patently evil, Satan. He won't abjure Satan. Uh, now, I thought for a little while at the end of the Soviet Union there was a possibility of doing this of getting beyond this. Nowadays we find ourselves way back into a period when once again, according to some, we live in a period where evil, where Satan is fighting God, defined by, shall we say, according to different textbooks on both sides. Manichaeism. Anyway. What? Manichaeism. Well, it's Manichaeanism. Uh, no, I don't mean Manichaeanism. It means that each side believes that uh, God is on their side and what the other side equals uh, Satan. It's not that there it's are not two... It's not dualism. It's not dualism, on the contrary. Uh, I mean, the, the fundamentalist Christians, who are not uncommon where you know you are, uh, believe it's uh, the Christian God. The fundamentalist Muslims believe it's a Muslim God. Anyway, I believe that that means it is more important than ever to emancipate ourselves from the 20th century world religion. I sort of dream that uh, supposing we could see the 20th century the way in which we would now see the 17th century. The only people who now see the 17th century the way everybody, the most intelligent others, saw the 17th century, are live in Belfast. For them, it's still absolutely vital, you see, who is for the Pope and who is for Martin Luther or John Calvin and so on. Now, uh, the fact that we think it's so odd that they think that in Belfast because nobody else thinks so. Well, I, I, I dream of the time when people will look about the fight, say, the Cold War, uh, in much the same way they're saying, how could people, intelligent people, have been committed completely to both of these sides? And just because I think we're in a second Cold War, ideologically speaking today, I think it's all the more important not to not to allow yourself to fall into it. I don't know whether you have a very key. good description of going, although it's a rather uh, dry description, if I may say so, but no less powerful for that, of making your first visit to the Soviet Union and finding you didn't really like it very much. Yeah, I mean, it was a hard time to be there. It was just about a year or so after the old man had died and nobody will talk to you. Uh, and you've got the feeling that, well, the, the awful business is, and it's a thing that I've, over the years, had to come to terms with. Being a communist outside 
when in fact the police are your enemy is uh, quite different from being a communist inside when you run the police. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, the people that I knew and that I belonged to are the people who are outside. Uh, when you were inside a country in which, like the Soviet Union used to be shortly after Stalin, you didn't know all the things that had happened, but it wasn't a nice country to be in. <coughs> there seems almost no alternative, in spite of your admonitions, with which I agree, to putting this question in a, in a sort of semi or quasi-religious manner. In other words, the suggestion of a, of a moment on the road to Damascus. But was there a moment when you suddenly thought, I may have chosen the wrong allegiance? An identifiable moment. No, the closest to that is when sometime in the early 50s, some people from India asked me and saying to write an article about some, uh, whatever it is, the international situation. And I came to a conclusion that the world revolution wasn't going to happen. That uh, there'd been a lot of things, and, you know, uh, millions, hundreds of millions had become joined my side. Uh, but nevertheless, it wasn't going to happen. The bulk of the world might have had the end of colonial empires, which was a great thing. I'm, I'm sufficiently old-fashioned, I won't say Marxist, but just leftist, to feel that empires are not a desirable thing. Uh, I'm sorry in your no, company, no, but uh, there you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's okay, I have a thick skin now. Well, uh, but still, there you are. But then I concluded, okay, if the world revolution is not going to happen, so what am I doing? So in other words, you abandoned it because you made a concrete analysis of a concrete situation, it might be said. I mean, yes, the, well, the, the Marxism outdoes the communism. Yes, the, the, Marxist does, the Marxism outdoes the communism. Uh, I think so, that it wasn't yeah. going to happen. You have, by the way, I must say, one of the most amazingly uh, suggestive sentences about uh, this problem, but in its non-political sense, when you say you're talking about politics and, and personal life, and you say, I confess that the moment when I recognized that I could envisage a real relationship with someone who was not a potential recruit to the party was the moment I recognized that I was no longer a communist in the full sense of my yeah, youth. Yeah. That's very, um, very... And then, since understatement seems to be one of your fortes, I can't resist reading this. I nearly read past this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, Professor Hobsbawm is in Cuba um, in the early 60s on a delegation, and he says, as for the delegation itself, all I can remember about it is that I found myself translating for Che, who in Fidel's place received us for lunch in the former Hilton Hotel. He was indeed as fine a figure of a man as he looks on the famous photo though he said nothing of interest. I, <laughs> I think I, I, I sort of have to congratulate you for in, a, in an autobiography that you really hope will sell, <laughs> making so little of your moment with Che Guevara. But, um, <laughs> something in you obviously doesn't like the celebrity culture, but, um, but Latin I mean, America was a, a great field of study and interest for you, I know. Yes, it's marvellous because, uh, in effect, I, I, I sort of discovered uh, a field, you see, sometimes. You call this stuff uh, the primitive rebels, which is actually, as it was slightly outside the range of an old-fashioned orthodox leftist. Uh, and uh, so I did travel around a lot and wrote all these things about... Uh, bandits as a social phenomenon and millennials and mafias and stuff like that. And then I said in Europe in the 20th century, late 20th century, these are fairly marginal phenomena. Let's go to somewhere where they're less marginal and where I can still talk to people, you know. And so I went to Latin America and I was completely sold on this, yes. But of course all this is such an eight, long, long time ago. It's very difficult, I suppose, uh, those of you who are in uh, my age range, or at least older, will constantly come up against the terrible problem 
of communicating with younger generations for whom the past is olden days. It's something that happened in the past, something which hasn't got a, a continuity. Where, for instance, uh, the difference between uh, dates is as irrelevant as deciding which came first in the once upon a time, mm -hmm. Snow White uh, or uh, Sleeping Beauty, you see. Well, uh, now for okay. us, who <laughs> have a sense of the past, it was absolutely essential to know which came first. There is a continuity, there is a life, there's a chronology. And it's one of the big problems for historians to try and communicate to younger generations for whom this stuff has no direct relationship with their life. You know, I mean, uh, the coming of Hitler, which for me is something I remember. I was walking home from school, or my marriage. It happened in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you see. But all these things are, it's like the days when I used to teach in America. And I used to mention this stuff about Hitler, and I got this strong impression that for these students, they thought I might as well have been in the theater when Lincoln was being assassinated. There was no real difference. It was so far away from them, you see. And the real problem, uh, not only for old people, but for historians, is somehow or other to recover the sense of the past as something, as, as a flow and as flow in which people are involved, and not something which just, just happened in the past, in which somehow you have to try and re-establish it. Because people do want to re-establish a link with the past. They just don't know how. Especially not in the United States, as you say. I'm, I'm, I've been teaching at Berkeley uh, this spring, and I, I carry a thermometer around with me all the time, testing my temperature for old fartery and... Um, oncoming curmudgeondom because <laughs> these are people to whom the Kennedy assassination, for example, is an extremely exactly. ancient, very ancient, ancient history indeed. Absolutely ancient. And it does give me a bit, of a, a bit of a turn. But I don't like you have the wonderful mnemonic or aid memoir of being able to remember I was born in 1917, which is a good sort of way <laughs> That's of... That's an easy one. You know, date clocking <laughs> in, as it were. Uh, <laughs> a good year for laying down your historians. You um, clock into world history yeah, at the right you moment. <laughs> yes. it, uh, just before we leave Latin America, it occurred to me um, from something you said that, in, especially in the period when you began to become involved with it, that Lat Latin America was the sort of semi-occupied, dominated hinterland of the United States mm. um, in a way not completely dissimilar to the way that Eastern Europe was a, an occupied and dominated area of the Soviet Union. And that by, by um, going to a place where, as it were, the, the, the magnet... Was the magnetic pole was reversed, you might, so to speak, uh, be writing in code about the difference between two kinds of imperialism. No, I don't think I was. Um, I think Eastern Europe was a very different thing. Uh, there were the people in Eastern Europe <coughs> which had made their genuine revolutions for the better notably in Yugoslavia. And when that broke down, the result is bad. And there were the others where, in a sense, the Russians came as an occupying army. Uh, in some instances, virtually without any local support. Uh, the trouble is, it was very difficult for everybody, inside or outside East. I tried from when I wrote about my own experiences of people in Eastern Europe, to try and see the one bit of Eastern Europe which I knew better than the others, uh, the German Democratic Republic, it just couldn't be seen just as a gulag. It had to be seen as, in its own way, a going concern. It was a rather nasty place. But as I say, uh, it was on the whole, uh, it tried to worry people to death rather than to kill them off. Well, <laughs> and bore them to death, too, I think. Boredom can be lethal. 
I think officially it bored them to death, but what this meant is that actually it, they, it, it encouraged them to develop the sort of thing that we find very difficult over here, namely a genuine private life with genuine friendships. Now this is, if there's any really positive side to be said about the Soviet Union, it is the enormous importance which personal relations and personal friendship had for people during that period when you couldn't really, unless you were in the business of politics or something, you couldn't really take that seriously beyond a certain point. Whereas personal life and, uh, and friends and relationships, I mean, friendship as something which is, which I found, for instance, in many years in the United States, the United States is extremely good at establishing short-term, quick relationships because people are used to moving in and out. Very good, neighborly and so on. But genuine friendships where you rely on people, where you can rely up to the death, if you like, on them, is something which is very much harder in a, that society than it, it, it was in those East European ones where personal relations were one of the very few. That's one of the reasons why people were so deeply hurt in Germany when they discovered that actually some of their friends had shocked them. Right to be hurt, too, if you yes. may say so. Absolutely right to be hurt. One in, one in five of the adult population was, an, was a police informer. It's something extraordinary. Uh, the thing is, you couldn't get out of the system. Uh, you couldn't get out of the system. I mean, if it comes to that Solzhenitsyn, actually, even Solzhenitsyn in Gulag wasn't out of the system. He wouldn't have survived had he been out of the system. He wouldn't have been able to publish anything if he had been out of the system. One way or another, you couldn't, you couldn't get out of that system. Your mention of friendship and um, collegiality and bonding and it makes me want to ask you, what I wanted to anyway, I'll do it now, about Cambridge where you spent so much of your life and the the bonding of the, the apostles and, um, and of what's sometimes been called the, the political climate of Cambridge at the time. And you're saying that there, you, you don't think there was much of an overlap between the apostles and the spies. Had you been asked to spy for Stalin, you'd probably have said yes. I want, often oh, we, would, we certainly would have done. Do you think you'd have been a good spy? No. no. <laughs> uh, too recognizable for one thing. <laughs> But the apostles you, you think of as a, a substitute family at, at some point, or a, a, no. um, a fraternity? Uh, no, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a sort of thing uh, from point of view of, as it were, status. Uh, you know, to be in a kind of outfit in which once upon a time you had... Uh, as it were, direct link to all the great 19th century names, Tennyson, Clark Maxwell, all these, and then the, even more the great Edwardian names. That's very good for undergraduates, you know. You can sell that to almost anybody, you know, they say, yeah. Um, but otherwise, I think their insistence on friendship, which is very much the sort of ideology of Ian e. Forster, uh, I, I got something out of that, I must say, not least from the old man himself. From Forster personally? From Forster, yes. I mean, you know, uh, even though we weren't on the same, in no sense were we on the same wavelength, you see. I mean, I tried to interest him in things uh, that he couldn't conceivably, and for one thing, I mean, uh, he, he wasn't really terribly happy with people who weren't gay either. You know, but out of sheer the obligations of friendship. <laughs> yes, one must be civil. Yeah. No, it's more than civil. You, 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 you know, you, you are genuine friends. That's, I mean, he used to come up and visit me when I was ill. You know, in, in, in college. I mean, I used to try and do things. I <laughs> did it. Before. I knew he wasn't going to like it. Like take him to hear Lenny Bruce, which is about the most absurd thing. You took Ian Forster to hear I Lenny Bruce. I took Ian Forster to hear Lenny Bruce. I would have bought, I would have bought tickets for both things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that. I mean, if anything, you know, if ever I want to be remembered in cultural <laughs> history, 
it's for having taken the M40 to hear Lenny Bruce. <laughs> but uh, he, did, he did not like it, but he, he was very civil about it. I took <clears> him back <throat> to him. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> to, rather to my surprise, uh, towards the end of your book, you talk quite a bit about things you're nostalgic for. Um, you mentioned not just the, um, the USSR, but um, uh, which, by the way, surprised you're nostalgic about. But you mentioned you, in England that, where people would sort of go bicycling or take the bus, or the, um, that kind of thing. Well, there's been uh, really two major changes <coughs> in, in England, me. Great Britain. I, I can't talk about Scotland. Could talk about Wales, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, there's, roughly speaking, in the mid-50s, the coincidence of Suez and rock and roll which utterly changed. I mean, Britain after that is different from what it was, totally different, uh, much less boring, uh, much more interesting, but nevertheless a different country. Uh, those people who were grown up, say, in the 30s, 40s and 50s, very difficult to recover that sort of thing. One reason why it's very hard for people to recover the 1930s. It, it's part of a different country. Nevertheless, on the whole, it transformed England, but it transformed it on the whole for the better. And then, of course, there was the change during Thatcher, when systematically what was left of the old pre-1955 England was deliberately being destroyed. Uh, and uh, some of it isn't, perhaps you might say, much lost, like the royal family. Uh, but nevertheless, all of it, everything, the, the good things about the old England, like, you know, the old labor movement, the old, even the old establishment, uh, the, the idea, what was it that a friend of mine who was a businessman told me that in the 80s, somebody was doing, trying to do a, uh, a takeover of his time. And so they hired a public relations man to do financial PR for him. And the great argument against this guy was he wasn't any good because he was a gentleman, mm. you see. Now, <laughs> there's a certain loss in that, you know. So there is in some ways, but then, how can one not be nostalgic, not only for the British things, even for your own things? Now, there's, uh, remember, nostalgia isn't only me. I remember being told by a man who's even older than me, and also from Central Europe, and ended up by being a great banker, still is a banker, travels around, for whatever it is. And he and two other pretty well-heeled characters found themselves at the end of a tired evening in Savoy. Yes? Mm -hmm. They were sitting down and suddenly they looked at each other and all three of them started singing the International. <laughs> uh, why did they do it? I was just about to ask. What? I was just about to ask myself. Yeah. They did it because they think some things have got lost. I don't know what you think about this particular story, whether you think it's just funny or whether you think it's sad or whether you think it's just plain bizarre or part of late 20th century. But you can't understand, I think, the 20th century without it. No. And I always stand up when I hear the international being played. It's a reflex. I I do. Um, well, I, I don't stand up with the international, but I deliberately make an effort not to stand up when the, royal, the, 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 the national <laughs> Well, that's, that's much easier. <laughs> from, from the days, remember, when every time at the end of every cinema or theatre thing, you had to get up and, and stand while they were playing. Yes, and I wouldn't stand up when the first showing of Dr. Zhivago got hit on the head with an umbrella from behind. <laughs> but if you remember in Dr. Zhivago, the international is sunk, so I stood up then. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, 
what a great pair of old reminiscers we're becoming. <laughs> I sort of was, it, it, it's been pointed out, but I'm not the first person to observe it. You would have been a wonderful sort of conservative academic in some ways, wouldn't you? Well, I wasn't ever a liberal. It's an extremely good answer, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, By the way, one of the things I am sentimental about and nostalgic about is Wales. Even though I, I live in one part of Wales now, but I'm sentimental and nostalgic about another part. Another well, you're right. I hope people are going to rush out and, and, and buy this book after we... <laughs> I, I should say now that I'm right in saying you'll be at the book tent immediately yes. after? Yes. Good. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful description of, uh, of Clough Williams Ellis and Port Merion and that, yes. that area of Wales. Though. Which, incidentally, so for those, if if that, that, that is, section yeah. of the gallery to which Professor Holzman was now playing, <laughs> should pay attention to that bit. It's very good about Wales. <laughs> um, you say you're nostalgic for the old Labour movement, and I know what you mean, but actually you, you're identified very much, in my mind, with the rather pitiless critique that was made of old Labour in the late 70s and early 80s. Late 70s, that some people think b began the collapse of the traditional assumptions of the movement. And you've no, got a very it interesting fellas, chapter about your... like your, your, your old mates who were in, in on this. I think you perhaps better enlarge. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, the, <coughs> the interests. Yes. There's a lot of those. Yes. Never was an interest, but... Um, no, you... Uh, no, no, no. I mean, I mean that wasn't ever... But you, you... No, but your original critique was, was of Labourism in general. Saying oh, yes. It had stalled out and become a, a reactionary force, uh, a sectarian or sectional at any rate force. I think there's a difference. I think there's a difference between people <coughs> who never had any illusion that the British working class, we didn't believe that the British working class actually was revolutionary. We thought it should be revolutionary. Uh, but there are some people who thought, well, uh, nevertheless, laborism is absolutely appalling. And you can't have anything to do with it. But for those of us who saw something of the British working class in the days when there was a British working class, when, uh, the, like the, the kind of lads that I got to know in the army, uh, well, like I say in the book, you know, we always believed that communists were supposed to think the working class was great. Actually, I thought within its limits it was. These were good guys, and, and you know, the, what, the, the sense of solidarity, the sense of helping each other, you don't expect necessarily e ideological or intellectual great exercises, but these were people who had an idea of what a fair society was yeah. or should be. They had great drawbacks, they were not believers in egalitarianism. They, in spite of what they said, they actually did believe the tops were better. That's why, you know, somebody like Harry Bridges, who came from Australia, yes. uh, who comes like the Australians and the Americans don't have that. But the Brits... You're talking about the Longshoremen's Union leader in yes. San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, the, the British labor, the British workers, in spite of the fact that within four, they believed that there was a part of their own part, their own thing in which nobody should interfere and people should be treated fair, but they did not actually at bottom believe they were as good as the next man. And I'm, I, it was very hard for me to... It was uh, now in Bevan once called um, Poverty of Ambition, I think. Yeah. Part of that. You know, I was also, I wanted to press you a bit more on your, this very withering critique that you have of the Labour leadership in the period of Foote, Kinnock, Ben, uh, the run-up, in fact, to Thatcherism, and your, the role that your own critique of this played in opening quite a big debate on the assumptions of Labourism. Well, it was a sort of walk-on part. Well, I think you're perhaps too modest. But <clears throat> you may also be avoiding the trap I'm trying to set for you, which is that, uh, <laughs> which is that when all that's been, in a sense, vindicated, the, the, the next thing that's going to happen is the Conservative victory, so that after all this work, you finally do get to take credit for a revolution, but it's naturalism. 
Just a thought. What's what? Um, <laughs> it's what Hegel once well, called. I mean, what Hegel once called the cunning of history. Well, I mean, um, I, I, I will take credit for saying that if you carry on like that, as people did in the 70s, you're going to be in trouble. And one of the reasons you're in trouble is a lot of the workers will actually abandon you because yeah. the workers didn't like this damn stuff. You see, and they, uh, what I said is unions were, in a sense, they were okay because you can't keep running a union unless you get the lads and lasses with you. You've got to mobilise them, you see. Whereas you can run a political party because uh, most of the members don't do anything and don't want to do anything, or at least nowadays they don't. Once upon a time, they, they did. And so, if you've got a few thousand people who get in charge and pass the resolutions, you can do an enormous amount of damage. And that's what is what happened in the 70s, and particularly in the early 80s. Um, and that's what I was against, I think. Uh, what they did is they more or less depoliticized a lot of their native constituency, the ordinary poor and laboring and working people, including some of the, well, the traditional labor people. It's, it, it's, it was a bad thing. And they haven't come back. And of course, people since, uh, since Blair, uh, they, 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 they're not really happy about being a party of that kind. I'm just waiting for when the Conservatives make an offer for Blair to come over. Very well. well I think I should cease to monopolise you now because I can't believe there are many people who would like, relish the chance to question you themselves. And why don't we start? Have we microphones? Yes. Gentlemen in the right in the front and centre there. I'm going to go to the podium for this bit so I can point to people. Mm. Professor Hobsbawm, um, thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, Bertrand Russell once said that the trouble with the world is that fools and fanatics are so certain of themselves and wise men so full of doubts. And I was wondering in your lifetime if you could um, maybe talk about or point to the one truly wise individual that uh, you think maybe you've met or maybe was uh, a contemporary of yours. I'm, I'm not big on gurus, I must say. Uh, I wouldn't call Bertrand Russell himself uh, an altogether reliable guide in these matters. <laughs> uh, I think wisdom isn't going hunting around for wise men. It's trying to learn from the experience of your life. I don't know how far we succeed in doing this. If you go on very, very long, as I've done, uh, you probably uh, have learned not to expect too much of it. If you do that, well, you've learned another thing. You've learned another thing is that every time that somebody says uh, something good is going to happen, you touch wood because you don't want to tempt fate. But um, I don't think it works. Uh, the alternative is to become cynical, but yeah, it's still something lost. The fanatics, the people who believe firmly, passionately in the thing, nothing gets done without them. This is one reason why you know, in some ways, I've, I've not felt unhappy being a teacher of students all my life. There's an enormous number of things you can say against students, particularly within students in public life, public affairs. But they are people who believe that things can be done in the world, that the world can be changed. And if people don't believe this when they're young, then there's not much hope. Okay. Professor Hobsbawm, you made an uh, um, almost throw a comment earlier in one of your answers about the fact that we may have already, I think, entered a second Cold War. Would you care to expand on that? 
Uh, well, uh, uh, apparently, uh, there's yet another evil uh, conspiracy against uh, the values of civilization. And if we don't all get together uh, and, 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 and fight it, uh, then uh, the world's in a poor shape. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike the last time round, uh, the evil conspiracy is rather ill-defined. Uh, it's either terrorism, which is a completely meaningless term by itself, or it's uh, some other religion, like Islam. Uh, what's a man's name who believed that we are now in a Civil uh, white hunting, is it? Hunting. Uh, a Sorry, battle, hunting. a, a conf confrontation of civilizations, the same sort of thing. Baloney, total baloney. Uh, the trouble is that you now have uh, the same amount and probably a greater amount of propaganda mobilized on behalf of this new view of the world. Uh, that we had uh, mobilized during the last time. And, uh, and I'm worried about it. Gentlemen there, at least this time, mind you, you can be sure you're fighting against the forces of reaction, John. <clears throat> uh, yes, there. Oh, all right, there. <laughs> I seem to have no pull here at all. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. That's okay. Let's do it. Yeah, you're next. Um, assuming it is possible for governments to learn anything from history, which of your books would you commend to Tony Blair and George Bush? Age of Extremes. Uh, I've tried actually to discuss the international situation today. Uh, it's, in general, I think it still stands up. It hasn't actually got as far as the American Declaration of World Empire yet, but that doesn't actually transform the situation either. So. Do you think that democracy is important, and are you sorry that Mao and Stalin didn't achieve world domination, and how long would you, do you think you would have survived if they had? No, I think uh, Mao and Stalin, it would have been a disaster. In the first place, Mao, of course, isn't into world domination. It's a great mistake to think that China is into world domination. China believes that it is the center of the world, uh, and the others should fit in. Uh, Stalin, if Stalin had believed that he was in he could, could have world domination, he might have gone in for it. But Stalin was believed only in controlling everything that was directly under his control. Outside that, he was very, very cautious. Too cautious, many people thought at the time. But certainly, the situations they wanted, the societies they wanted, were horrifying. Why they were horrifying is a big problem, particularly for people uh, who were communists. Uh, the question is, was this implicit in it? My view is that certainly an authoritarian regime in Russia was implicit in the October Revolution. And for that reason, while during most of my life I thought okay, that's it, we've got to make the best of it. I'm not certain that now I think it wouldn't have been better if the October Revolution hadn't been declared, that, that it stopped earlier on. However, as far as democracy is concerned, there's a big problem here. I believe on grounds which I cannot totally justify that I believe in uh, universal rights, and if you like, that the right, all human beings have the right to be treated in the same way and that if there is to be any politics, it's got to be in the interests of everybody. 
not just of the rich or the intelligent or the, rich, the powerful and all the rest of it. It's got to be. And what's more, uh, but I do not frankly believe that democracy, either in the form of uh, electoral, regular elections, or in the more extreme forms which once upon a time were being uh, peddled around in the 1960s, is a good way of running things. And that's the big problem. Uh, it's government for the people, but not government by the people. Or at least, any because no government is actually government by the people, uh, unless it's in very small communities. And if it's in very small communities, the price is that you don't actually change very much. Uh, gentlemen, uh, back there. Yeah. And then the lady there in the um, middle. And in if, anyone, if anyone has a question, said. excuse me, if anyone has a question on jazz, which I didn't know enough to ask Professor Hobson about, he is a great expert in this field too, and has written very well, although under another name, about it. So I would entertain a jazz question if there was one. I'm sorry, go ahead. In light of what you've just said, if you could talk to your 1930s self, would you tell him not to spy for Joseph Stalin? Sorry? In light of what you've just said, condemning, saying that the dominance of Joseph Stalin would have been a bad thing, yet you've admitted you would have acted to secure it and to spread it to Britain, uh, when you said that you would have spied for Joseph Stalin, you repeated it in your book as well. Oh, in if, the you, if you could speak, if you could now say to the Eric Hobsbawm of the 1930s anything, would you say to him, don't do it, don't spy for Stalin, and wouldn't that have changed the course of your life entirely? No, I wouldn't have said that. I mean, in the 1930s, it's perfectly clear that the only way of fighting fascism, which on grounds which I don't need to go into, I regard it as a far the greatest danger in the world, uh, the only way to do it is uh, for the various countries, including uh, the Soviet Union, to go on the right side. Uh, all the governments, including the government of the Soviet Union, tried to come to terms with Hitler. Uh, we were right in saying you couldn't come to terms with Hitler, and in the end, uh, in fact, uh, that's what happened. Uh, a great united front of liberal uh, capitalism and communism uh, defeated Stalin, sorry, defeated Hitler. Uh, and I think that was the right thing. That was the only way to go. And in the 1930s, uh, I, I, it, the, the idea that you could, that there was an alternative to this, was fantasy. There's a lady with a green scarf in the middle. Oh, you've got it, good. Professor Hobsbawm, how's the future going to judge the occupation of Iraq and the destruction of, for example, the antiquities? which survived 6,000 years until today? Well, the destruction of antiquities, the trouble is when you get the barbarians occupying a country, all sorts of things get, mis get, get messed up. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think in many ways uh, the Iraq war, though I think it was pretty good from a military point of view and rather uh, impressive piece of work from that point of view, though I'm not a judge, uh, was run by people who were barbarians. They had no interest in the country, in the culture. Uh, they believed the kind of uh, shall we put it like this, they were not even believers in the ordinary duties of people who occupy countries, namely to keep order uh, and to stop looting. Uh, they had a bunch of characters, most of them come from the inland and from the minorities in the United States, 
who are not hired to do that. They're hired to win wars and to uh, then go home again. And it's bad luck on the Iraqis. Uh, but that is, that doesn't justify, you know, that's, not, that's irrelevant to the actual question. The main problem is that the Iraq war was not necessary. Iraq was a nasty regime, of which there are several others in the world. It was not a danger. It didn't, it wasn't a danger even to the locals, to the, to, to the region. It was simply a country which uh, once upon a time had been beaten by the United States and refused to lie down. And this is why I suspect that the next victim isn't actually going to be Syria, even though Syria would fit in much more with the sort of Israeli line on uh, the Middle East, but Iran, because Iran is another country which was backed once upon a time by the United States and then threw them out. And there's an awful lot of grudge, old-fashioned grudge, uh, in the what current passes as American policy today. I don't understand it. The United States actually had a world empire. They had a po perfectly sensible policy for a world empire. They had it uh, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, uh, there was nothing to stop it. And there's no actual reason why I can understand why uh, the, 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 the current policy has, 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 has developed. It makes no sense in any traditional diplomatic and international policies. I mean, I would like if, if, if Kissinger wasn't a man who was incapable of saying, speaking the truth even to himself any moment, I would like actually to ask him what he as an old-fashioned, brutal, cynical, real politician, real politiker, actually thinks of what the, the guys up there in, in the Pentagon are trying to do now. However, this is a matter on which uh, no clear answer has yet been found, and certainly uh, we are not likely to agree. <laughs> I can tell you uh, that um, Henry Kissinger and the members of Kissinger Associates, Lawrence Eagleberger, Brent, Brent Scowcroft and the others, were all very much opposed to the regime change policy for precisely the That's extremely exactly. reactionary reasons that the professor has adumbrated so well. <laughs> um, there's a, a promised a question here, I think. Professor, it's been a delight listening to you. I have a rather a question which comes from economics. Gresham's law states that bad money always drives out good money. Aren't the, isn't the lesson of history that for doctrines, the bad version of a doctrine always drives out the good versions of a doctrine? Stalinism and communism, maybe fundamentalism in religions, and there are many other parallels. Um, I'm not sure that this applies to uh, doctrines, <coughs> uh, which don't, the doctrines don't work by markets. Uh, it may apply, if you like, to the only kind of intellectual life that does apply to market, which is uh, advertising. Uh, I think the trouble about the doctrine, state doctrines don't, supply, don't, don't survive. That is the one thing that I think I have. If there is to be a doctrine which actually survives, it's got to have roots which are other than simply by being official. That doesn't mean that good doctrines, uh, only good doctrines, succeed in doing so. Uh, one of the th things that strikes me about the difference between the end of communism and, say, the end of um, some of the older empires, the Spaniards lost their colonial empire getting on for 200 years ago but the bulk of Latin America is Catholic. That doesn't mean it's Catholic in any official sense, but in some way or other, in the course of these centuries, the local inhabitants kind of arranged to 
combine their own old beliefs with these new beliefs and that, that stayed. Whereas I think this is not a thing that happened uh, when the Soviet Union fell. The surprising thing is how little there was left because so much of it had simply come from the top. We don't know how much of it is left at the bottom. There may be a lot more left at the bottom which we cannot judge. For instance, if you look at the map of Eastern Europe, you try, there is a great borderland between the area west of which all the statues of Lenin and Stalin were destroyed, all the statues of Stalin, and the area within which they were not destroyed. There is a large area starting in what once upon a time was eastern Poland, which is now in, you know, the borders between Poland and uh, Belarusia, and going from the east where the statues of Lenin are still there and weren't destroyed. Now, we don't, we can't, that is a way in which, if you like, the heritage has somehow or other actually managed to become part of the life of the people who were in there. It's too early to judge. We can judge as it were the same thing. It's going to be too early to judge, if you like, the heritage of empires, the our old colonial empires. How much is left in India? How much is left in Africa? How much? A lot of it was left in some ways or other in, in curiously enough, though one wouldn't have expected it. A lot of it was left in, in the Caribbean. So it's a difficult one to judge, but the one way not to judge it is by markets. Sorry, we're going into something else. With infinite regret, um, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you I've had a, an electronic signal that tells me that was the last question and the last answer. I'm, I'm extraordinarily sorry for this. I know that.